Audible and C-SPAN are pleased to present the press conference from the 9-11 Commission's final report. This event took place on July 22, 2004. Today we present this report and these recommendations to the President of the United States, to the United States Congress, and the American people. This report represents the unanimous conclusion of the National Commission on Terrorist Attacks upon the United States. On September 11, 2001, 19 men armed with knives, box cutters, mace, and pepper spray penetrated the defenses of the most powerful nation in the world. They inflicted unbearable trauma on our people, and at the same time, they turned the international order upside down. At this point, we would like to ask you to remember for a moment how you felt that day. The grief, the enormous sense of loss. But remember also how we came together that day as a nation. Young and old, rich and poor, didn't matter whether you were a Republican or a Democrat. We had a deep sense of hurt, but out of that came a deep sense of purpose. We knew what we had to do as a nation to respond, and we did. But it's also fair to say that on that September day, we were unprepared. We did not grasp the magnitude of a threat that had been gathering over a considerable period of time. As we detail in our report, this was a failure of policy, management, capability, and above all, a failure of imagination. Now, we recognize, as commissioners, that we have the benefit of hindsight. And since the plotters were flexible and resourceful, we cannot know whether any single step or series of steps would have defeated them. What we can say with a good deal of confidence is that none of the measures adopted by the United States government before 9-11 disturbed or even delayed the progress of the Al-Qaeda plot. There were several unexploited opportunities. Our government did not watch list future hijackers, Hosmi and Midhoff, before they arrived in the United States, or take adequate steps to find them once they were here. Our government did not link the arrest of Zakaris Massawi, described as interested in flight training for the purpose of using the airplane as a terrorist act to the heightened indications of attack. Our government did not discover false statements and visa applications or recognize passports that were manipulated in a fraudulent manner. Our government did not expand no fly lists to include names from terrorist watch lists or require airline passengers to be more thoroughly screened. These examples are make up part of a broader national security picture where the government failed to protect the American people. The United States government was simply not active enough in combating the terrorist threat before 9-11. Our diplomacy and foreign policy failed to extract bin Laden from his Afghan sanctuary. Our military forces and covert action capabilities did not have the options on the table to defeat Al-Qaeda or kill or capture either bin Laden or his top lieutenants. Our intelligence and law enforcement agencies did not manage or share information or effectively follow leads to keep pace with a very nimble enemy. Our border, immigration, and aviation security agencies were not integrated into the counterterrorism effort. And much of our response on the day of 9-11 was improvised and ineffective, even as extraordinary individual acts of heroism saved countless lives. Our failures took place over many years and administrations. There's no single individual who is responsible for our failures. Yet individuals and institutions cannot be absolved of responsibility. 
any person in a senior position within our government during this time bears some element of responsibility for our government's actions. Having said that, it is not our purpose to assign blame. As we said at the outset, we look back so that we can look forward. Our goal is to prevent future attacks. Every expert with whom we spoke told us that an attack of even greater magnitude is now possible and even probable. We do not have the luxury of time. We must prepare and we must act. The Al-Qaeda network and its affiliates are sophisticated, patient, disciplined, and lethal. Osama bin Laden built an infrastructure and organization that was able to attract, train, and use recruits against even more ambitious targets. He rallied New Zealanders with each demonstration of Al-Qaeda's capability. His message and his hate-filled ideology have instructed and inspired untold recruits and imitators. He and Al-Qaeda despise America and its policies. They exploit political grievances and hopelessnesses within the Arab and Islamic world. They indoctrinate the disaffected and pervert one of the great world's great religions. And they seek creative methods to kill Americans in limitless numbers, including if they can do it with the use of chemical, biological, and nuclear weapons. Put simply, the United States is faced with one of the greatest security challenges in our long history. We have struck blows against the terrorists since 9-11. We have, we believe, prevented attacks on the homeland. We do believe we are safer today than we were in 9-11, but we are not safe. Because Al-Qaeda represents an ideology, not a finite group of people, we should not expect the danger to recede greatly as years to come. No matter whom we kill or capture, including Osama bin Laden himself, there will be still those who plot against us. Bin Laden has inspired affiliates and imitators. The societies they prey on are vulnerable, the terrorist ideology is potent, and the means for inflicting harm are readily available. We cannot let our God down. Congressman Hamilton. Before continuing our narrative, may I simply rise to a point of personal privilege to say what remarkable leadership we have had from the chairman of this commission. Uh, one of these days, I'm going to create a public servant hall of fame, Tom, and you're going to go in on the first ballot. I assure you, and we've had remarkable support from a dedicated group of commissioners and a highly talented staff headed by Dr. Zellico and Chris Kojum and Dan Marcus and others, and we are deeply indebted to them, as Tom will say again in a few minutes. I begin with the recommendations. This commission, of course, does not have all of the answers, but we have thought about what to do, a global strategy, and how to do it, a different way of organizing our government. But based on our thorough review of the government's performance and our examination of the enemy, we recommend the following elements for a counterterrorism strategy. This strategy must be balanced it must integrate all the elements of national power, diplomacy, intelligence, covert action, law enforcement, economic policy, foreign aid, homeland defense, and military strength. There is no silver bullet or decisive blow that can defeat Islamic terrorism. It will take unity of effort and sustained and effective use of every tool at our disposal. We need to play offense, to kill or to capture the terrorists, deny them sanctuaries, and disrupt their ability to move money and people around the globe. We need to ensure that the key countries like Afghanistan and Pakistan and Saudi Arabia 
are stable, capable, and resolute in opposing terrorism. We need to sustain a coalition of nations that cooperates bilaterally and multilaterally with us in the counterterrorism mission. We need a better dialogue between the West and the Islamic world. We also highlight the need to restrict and roll back the proliferation of the world's most dangerous weapons. We need to put forth an agenda of opportunity, economic, educational, political, so that young people in the Arab and Islamic world have peaceful and productive avenues for expression and hope. We need to join the battle of ideas within the Islamic world, communicating hope instead of despair, progress in place of persecution, life instead of death. This message should be matched by policies that encourage and support the majority of Muslims who share these goals. At home, we need to set clear priorities for the protection of our infrastructure and the security of our transportation. Resources should be allocated based upon those priorities and standards of preparedness should be set. The private sector and local governments should play an important part in this process. We need secure borders with heightened and uniform standards of identification for those entering and exiting the country, and an immigration system able to be efficient, allowing good people in while keeping the terrorists out. If, God forbid, there is another attack, we must be ready to respond. We must educate the public, train and equip our first responders, and anticipate countless scenarios. We recommend significant changes in the organization of government. We know that the quality of the people is more important than the quality of the wiring diagrams. Good people can overcome bad structures. They should not have to. Day and night, dedicated public servants are waging the struggle to combat terrorists and protect the homeland. We need to ensure that our government maximizes their efforts through information sharing, coordinated effort, and clear authority. A critical theme that emerged throughout our inquiry was the difficulty of answering the question, who is in charge? Who ensures that agencies pool resources, avoid duplication, and plan jointly? Who oversees the massive integration and unity of effort necessary to keep America safe? Too often, the answer is no one. Thus, we are recommending a national counterterrorism center. We need effective unity of effort on counterterrorism. We should create a national counterterrorism center to unify all counterterrorism intelligence and operations across the foreign and the domestic divide in one organization. Right now, these efforts are too diffuse across the government. They need to be unified. We recommend a national intelligence director. We need unity of effort in the intelligence community. We need a much stronger head of the intelligence community and an intelligence community that organizes itself to do joint work in national mission centers. We need reforms of the kind the military had two decades ago. We need a Goldwater-Nichols reform for the intelligence community. The intelligence community needs a shift in mindset and organization so that intelligence agencies operate under the principle of joint command with information sharing as the norm. We need reform in the United States Congress. 
We need unity of effort in the Congress. Right now, authority and responsibility are too diffuse. The Intelligence Committees do not have enough power to perform effectively their oversight work. Oversight for Homeland Security is splintered among too many committees. We need much stronger committees performing oversight of intelligence. And we need a single committee in each chamber providing oversight of the Department of Homeland Security. We need reform in the FBI. We need a stronger national security workforce within the FBI. We do not support the creation of a new domestic intelligence agency. What the FBI needs is a specialized and integrated national security workforce consisting of agents, analysts, linguists, and surveillance specialists. These specialists need to be recruited, trained, rewarded, and retained to ensure the development of an institutional culture with deep expertise in intelligence and national security. We need changes in information sharing. We need unity of effort in that task. The United States government has access to vast amounts of information, but it has a weak process a weak system of processing and using that information. Need to share must replace need to know. And we need a better process for transitions between one administration and another for national security officials so that this nation does not lower its guard every four or eight years. These and other recommendations are spelled out in great detail in our report. We have made a limited number of recommendations focusing on the areas we believe most critical. We are acutely sensitive to the need to vigorously protect our liberties as we secure and guard our security. We endorse many of the actions taken in the, week, uh, in the wake of 9-11 to facilitate government action and information sharing. But we stress that these measures need to be accompanied by commitment to our open society and the principle of review, safeguards that are built into the process and accompanied by vigorous oversight. We must, after all is said and done, preserve the liberties that we are fighting for. Thank you, Congressman Hamilton, uh, one of the most decent and thoughtful men I've ever had the pleasure to know. Before we close, we offer just a few more thoughts. We approached our task with a deep respect for the place of September 11th in our nation's history. We have compared the shock, some have compared the shock we felt to Pearl Harbor, others to the Kennedy assassination. There are no comparisons. This was a moment unique in its horror in our long history. As in every four years in this democracy, we are in the midst of a presidential campaign. Our two great parties will disagree, and that is right, and that is proper. At the same time, on this subject, we must unite to make our country safer. Republicans and Democrats must unite in this cause. The American people must be prepared for a long and difficult struggle. We face a determined enemy who sees this as a war of attrition, indeed as an epical struggle. We expect further attacks. Against such an enemy, there can be no complacency. This is the challenge of our generation. As Americans, we must step forward and we must meet that challenge. 
We have reviewed as a commission two and a half million pages of documents. We've interviewed over 1,200 individuals, including experts and officials past and present. Our work has been assisted by a superb staff. Each one of these professionals has provided dedication and expertise that has often exceeded our very highest expectations. And we also had the honor of working with an extraordinary group of Americans, our commissioners. Each has shown skill, determination, and collegiality. We close, most importantly, by thanking the families who lost loved ones on 9-11. You demanded the creation of this commission. You have encouraged us every step of the way as partners and as witnesses. From your grief, you have drawn strength. You have given that strength to us. And we are determined, as you instructed us, to do everything possible to prevent other families from ever suffering such a tragedy again. On that beautiful September day, we felt great hurt. But we believed and we acted as one nation. We united as Americans have always united in the face of any common foe. Five Republicans and five Democrats have come together today with that same unity of purpose. We file no additional views in this report. We have no dissents. We have each decided that we will play no active role in the full presidential campaign. We will still instead devote our time as we have to work together in support of the recommendations in this report. You see, we believe that acting together as Republican Democrats, we can make a difference. We can make our nation safer. We can make our nation more secure. We'd be happy to take your questions. Why was it that uh, you decided as, as a commission not to uh, say whether the attacks could have been prevented or not prevented, given all the information that you have accumulated over the 20 months? Excuse me, I didn't hear the beginning of the question. It's, it's coming out now. I think the microphone didn't work well. Uh, could why, you repeat why, the question? Why was there no determination about whether the attacks could have been prevented or not prevented, given all of the information that you have accumulated over the past 20 months? What we did is present the facts as we learned. As you look at these facts, time after time, you will find, as we, as we detailed, uh, people who got in to this country who should not have gotten in, because that travel documents didn't earn that distinction. Uh, we document intelligence agencies who didn't share information. We document actions by the government that should have been taken and were not taken. But you asked, would any single one of these things, or even in combination, are we sure that if they had occurred in a different way, that 9-11 would have prevented? I can't say we are sure. We do not know. We think it's possible. But uh, we have not drawn that absolute conclusion because we don't believe that absolute conclusion is justified by the facts. Hi, John Diamond, USA Today. The, going through the report, the findings seem to focus on a whole array of problems. The proposals for solution are focused narrowly in structural solutions, changes in the, in the shape of government. Uh, the families are already being quoted today as saying that they view this as very, very important. Their next step will be to see that these are implemented. I'm wondering if there's any concern that it's kind of a false promise, the idea that if the structure is fixed, that as you say, Mr. Chairman, that there will not be or may not be another attack such as this, that structural reform is the answer to preventing another 9-11. Uh, 
Uh, I think the report is uh, much broader than your question might suggest. Uh, you are correct that uh, an important part of the report uh, focuses on organizational change in the executive branch uh, and in the Congress. And in my remarks a moment ago, I emphasized those. But in the complete report, we recognize the necessity of uh, doing another, uh, a number of things to attack the terrorists, to deny them sanctuaries, uh, to provide uh, stability and security in the key countries, Afghanistan and Pakistan and Saudi Arabia. We have a section in the report on the trying to prevent the growth of terrorism. And this is a very formidable challenge, as all of you can appreciate, because what it means is we have to engage in ideas with the Muslim world. We have to develop American policies that uh, we understand the consequences of. We need to put together all of the elements of a counterterrorism strategy which I identified, I think, a little earlier. And we recommend a number of steps to be taken to protect against and to prepare for terrorist attacks. Uh, so if you look at all of the report, you will find uh, a good many recommendations beyond those relating to the organization of government, dealing with American foreign policy, uh, dealing with uh, how you respond to attacks, uh, dealing with the important question of the security of our borders and immigration policy, uh, dealing with the question of terrorist financing, uh, and of course law enforcement and many other matters. I think it's a very complete and comprehensive report. The report, of course, is driven by the mandate of the Commission. We did not choose the mandate, it was given to us. And the statute identifies the areas that we are to approach, to make recommendations on, and that is what we've done to the best of our ability. Congressman Roma? What we, what we have tried to do in making recommendations is not to look only at the boxes and the dynamic structural and systemic changes, but to also concentrate on the people. We have looked in the intelligence area and, as Lee and Tom have said, made some very dramatic changes, revolutionary changes, with a national counterterrorism center and with a national intelligence director. But we also have stressed the importance of transforming our capability of training people in languages in rebuilding our human intelligence, in making sure that when we're recruiting people in the front end, that we get the right kinds of people uh, for the CIA. We have done the same thing in the FBI. While we have not picked an MI5 and not endorsed uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, Directorate of Intelligence reform that the FBI is currently doing, we picked a third option a national security intelligence service concentrating on the people and the skills, concentrating on making sure, again, linguists and analysts are trained properly, that they have career tracks within the FBI that will reward that intelligence and counter-terror service. And finally, in Congress, we have said dramatic change is needed, but the people in Congress that are so instrumental for us to tackle this problem have to do their oversight better, more appropriately, and more diligently. This is not only about structure and reform of systems and organizations. It is also about the people in those roles that are so dramatically important to getting this done right. Both must be reformed. I think the uh, philosophy which has guided our recommendations and their presentation in, in that narrow, focused form it's driven by first things first. If you look at the failures in the American governments that led to 9-11, it was largely a failure to unearth and share information because the boxes were spread out all over the place. Look at Masawi. 
It rose all the way in Massawi to the head of the CIA, but it only rose to this level in the FBI, and they never came together. Very stark failure of information sharing and focus. Could that have prevented 9-11? We don't know, but that failure is there. If I were the President of the United States, I would want sitting next to me in a cabinet meeting a national director of intelligence so that I could fix responsibility in one person for issues of this sort. And I would want those counterterrorism center people down the hallway. And if I were in the Congress of the United States, I would want to make sure that I was protected from the accusation that oversight, funding, authorization, and appropriations were not adequate. Our reform recommendations are urgent. We have come together with the families to agree on that. If these reforms are not the best that can be done for the American people, then the Congress and the President need to tell us what's better. But if there is nothing better, they need to be enacted and enacted speedily, because if something bad happens while well, these recommendations are sitting there, the American people will quickly fix political responsibility for failure, and that responsibility may last for generations, and they will be entitled to do that. Everyone was caught unawares by September 11th. The President, the Congress, the American people, law enforcement agencies, blame if there's blame has to be spread all across the board because the American people never demanded more or better. But now we've been warned, specifically warned, and now we've been told by everyone from the President of the United States on down it's going to happen again. And if it happens and we haven't moved, then the American people are entitled to make very fundamental judgments about that. Chitra Raghavan, U.S. News and World Report magazine. You've done a tremendous amount of digging, clearly, to describe the plot and how it was executed, but do you walk away with some unanswered questions, areas that frustrated you and that you still don't have answers to? There are still some unanswered questions because, obviously, the people who were at the heart of the plot are dead. Um, if we capture um, Osama bin Laden, when we capture Osama bin Laden, I hope, uh, and he answers questions, uh, there may be new information. We've always been what uh, the Vice Chairman has called in the middle of a moving stream on this one. Uh, our report, we believe, is a definitive work on 9-11. But is, are there some questions that can only be answered by people who are not in the United States custody at the moment? Very possibly. And those are answers we might find in the future. But we have done the best of our ability. We've seen every piece of paper that is out there. We've interviewed every uh, person who had any responsibility in the area uh, under two administrations. And uh, we believe as of today that every question we were able to answer has been answered in this report. And just to follow up a moment on that, I think you will find when you read the report that where we don't know an answer or where there's a logical next step that was not discernible, that we've noted it. Uh, we don't. We, uh, there's nothing in here uh, that we were trying to put to the side just because we didn't know a final answer on it. All we could give the American public and give ourselves in our deliberations was the very best and the most we could find. I think uh, uh, people, particularly uh, with expertise in the area of government, will see that the amount of information we have collected from within the government is of extraordinary breadth and unique in many instances in the type of information which has been put forward and made available publicly heretofore in various other contexts reports of this nature have been restricted have been subject to classification and the public has not had the benefit of the knowledge which those who conducted the investigation uh, were presented. In our case, uh, as you know, uh, we had 
certain roadblocks. We had uh, to push hard for information. We believe that we have done a credible job in unearthing the information which was within our government, and we have gone further. We have attempted to uh, get information uh, which was the result of uh, ongoing interrogations of others who had information, and we have made judgments about the integrity of that information and have reported that. And so uh, we have done our level best to bring forward to the public, and we have done so as we have moved along, all relevant information within our ability uh, to put forward. And I think the American public can feel that this was a credible effort led by extraordinary people uh, and an extraordinary staff, very talented, very dedicated, and extraordinarily hardworking. Hi, Jeff Rawson from WABC in New York. And speaking about New York specifically for a moment, you heard a good deal in the hearings about radio failures and technical problems. And while you make reference to it in the report, you mentioned that your recommendation is to create a signal core. What exactly does that mean, and how would that solve the, the radio problems that we experienced in New York? We, uh, John we Lehman. Un we uncovered a, 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 a fairly significant range of command, control, and communications problems. Now, uh, specifically, your question refers to the communications problems. The military has struggled with this for a long time. Now, today, the order of, uh, normal order of military operations involves all services, integrated, working together. Uh, radios that are designed to work at sea don't uh, necessarily work in uh, intense land environments, in cities, in buildings. Uh, the, military learned long ago that you need a systems approach to radios uh, and to connectivity. In cities like New York especially, that is uh, 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 one of the chief, remains one of the, the, the most important, valuable targets of our enemy, we have to be able to assure the connectivity between the commanders, the civilian commanders on scene, the mayor and the civilian authorities, the fire department, uh, fire departments of adjacent areas, of police departments, and in totally different environments, tunnels, skyscrapers, uh, uh, at, at, in the port areas, and so forth. There's no one radio you can buy to fix that. And so you need a systems approach like the military uses. Every uh, military unit that deploys to an operational area has a signal core type unit with it that has the robust communications of different kinds that can keep the different units connected together and communicating whether it's in a uh, ship to shore or an air to ground or a ground to ground environment and with the people trained on how to assure uh, a, a fail-safe connectivity. That does not exist in New York or most other cities today. And with the assistance of the Pentagon and the federal government, it is a very high priority that this kind of connectivity be uh, established to deal with threats in the future. Thank you, John. Now, I might say, as far as New York City goes, I personally feel one of the most important recommendations is that monies from Homeland Security should not be given out as a revenue sharing program, but should be given the largest amounts by far to the areas of greatest need and the most prominent targets. And that would, I presume, give most of that money to New York City uh, with Washington equal or a close second. Uh, Thanks. Steve Hayes with the Weekly Standard. Um, on this question of the Iraq-Al-Qaeda relationship, uh, it looks as if in this final report you sort of scaled back some of the language uh, from the staff statement with respect to that uh, finding of no collaborative relationship. This time you say no collaborative operational relationship 
with regard to the attacks on the United States. I wondered if you might just address that, and then on the same lines, uh, whether you're talking about Richard Clark's emails contained in this final report or Secretary Cohen's testimony to the commission, uh, it appears that the Clinton administration believed in 1998 and, and believes today that Iraq provided at least some chemical weapons expertise to Al Qaeda, uh, and wondered if you had a comment on that. Thanks. Well, there was no question in our minds that there was a relationship uh, between Iraq and Al Qaeda. Um, there was one point uh, there was thought maybe even Al Qaeda would find sanctuary in Iraq, and there were conversations that went on over a number of years, sometimes successful, sometimes unsuccessfully. While we don't know about weapons collaboration, particularly chemical collaboration, there was a suspicion in the Clinton administration that when they fired that bomb at that factory, uh, that if, in fact, there were chemicals there, they may have come from Iraq. Uh, so there was a relationship. Having said that, uh, we found no relationship whatever between Iraq and the attack on 9-11. Uh, that just doesn't exist. So I think we were very careful in our wording. In, in using that word collaborative relationship. I mean, that's what we, that's what we found. It's, it's language that's evidence-based. I think there's a very, and further response, I, I think there's a very large distinction between evidence of converse, <clears throat> excuse me, evidence uh, of uh, conversations that might have occurred between Iraq and Al-Qaeda on the one hand, and an emerging um, strategy or emerging assistance, concrete on the other. And what we do not have, as the chairman said, is any evidence of a concrete uh, collaborative operational uh, agreement. Conversations, yes, but nothing concrete. Uh, Vince Morris, I'm with the New York Post. Um, I have a question about Saudi Arabia. Um, in reading the report, I noticed that the language that you use to describe that Saudi Arabia is very vague and it seemed to actually a little watered down given what that country's track record is. I wonder if you can explain that. And I also wonder if you can get into why you did not address any of the issues that have been raised recently um, by filmmaker Michael Moore about connections between the Saudi family and the bin Laden family and the Bush administration and whether that may have played any role in, in all of this. Well, I haven't seen Mr. Moore's film. I'm not sure what those allegations are. Uh, we do we do talk uh, quite definitively <clears throat> about the allegation that there was a flight of Saudis that took off um, before airspace was open, authorized by high level <laughs> the United States government without the um, pro proper interviewing by the FBI. And what we say, that story is just not true. Uh, that, that plane that plane took off. It took off. Uh, after the airspace was open, after the FBI, the FBI had screened uh, the people, and it was authorized by Mr. Clark. Uh, we do handle that one. Uh, we, we didn't water down any language that I'm aware of in Saudi Arabia. What we do say is that we've got to get beyond this relationship having to do with just oil. Uh, we have got to work with the Saudi government uh, that shares a very common interest with us now because the terrorists would be very, very, just as happy, I think, to destroy the government in Saudi Arabia right now as they would our own government. And they have a very common interest in working with us against the terrorists at this point, who have attacked them as much as, as well as attacked us. Uh, we do believe, however, that our, our relationship with that country cannot be just, we'll ignore this and that, and they'll give us oil and everything will be fine. Uh, we have got to help them and urge them to implement reforms gain some stability in that country, uh, to help us trace money if money is a, a problem uh, as, as, it, as it gets to terrorist organizations. And, and, uh, Tom, if I, yeah. uh, if I may add to that, we, we have found no evidence of the involvement of the Saudi government in the plot. Uh, we have found evidence of individual Saudis and Saudi charities, uh, whether witting or unwitting, we do not know, uh, whose funds have found their way to the support of uh, al-Qaeda uh, and terrorism. Um, since 9-11, and especially since May of 2003, uh, 
Saudi cooperation with regard to the United States has uh, sharply improved, and they are helping us now on the terrorist uh, financing issue. Uh, they've taken steps to tighten up the regulation in their financial communities uh, to guard against uh, terrorist financing. As the chairman mentioned, this is a very difficult relationship for the United States and has been for a long time. But uh, we want to see that, it, that relationship get more depth and texture to it uh, than it has had in the past uh, several decades. And uh, that relationship should include a shared commitment to political and economic reform uh, in the kingdom and a shared commitment to greater respect for tolerance uh, in the society and a shared commitment uh, to fight terrorism and a shared commitment in the reform area uh, to improve the quality of education. Uh, this is a very large agenda that we uh, need to develop with the Saudis because it's such a very important country in this uh, war on terrorism. Senator Gordon. I think, you know, in a, in a, in a sense it's difficult to uh, yeah, answer a negative. But in the report, we include all of the facts that we regard relevant to uh, al-Qaeda uh, and uh, you know, the United States and Saudi Arabia and Iraq uh, to the charge which we were given. Uh, you know, we do not spend a lot of time, you know, attempting to prove negatives. We lay out the evidence. We lay out the facts. By and large, the uh, conclusions from those facts are left to uh, uh, the American people to make, except when they seem to, to us that, uh, to be obvious. So the materials in here on Saudi Arabia are the materials we consider relevant to our report. The materials in here on Iraq are the materials we consider relevant uh, to the report. Thompson indicated that policymakers will ignore your recommendations sort of at their own peril, but some of these recommendations have been out for a long time. For example, the joint inquiry two years ago recommended a director of national intelligence. Your charter expires in a month. The legislative calendar is very short. You're in an election year. What concrete steps can you take to ensure that your report isn't just on a bookshelf somewhere like so many other blue uh, ribbon commissions? We have been working on that one ever since the day we were created. <laughs> Uh, we, read, uh, we read those other reports. Uh, there are a number of commissions who made first-class recommendations. If they'd been implemented, this country would have been better and safer. They were not implemented. They were ignored. Uh, the the uh, hart rudman Commission comes to mind. The Lockerbie Commission is another one. All commissions which made good recommendations. We have determined as a commission not to let that happen. Now, these are tough recommendations. These are not easy to implement. One of the reasons some of the ones have been implemented yet that have made already is because they're tough. They're not easy to do. A lot of these recommendations require changing around the United States government in ways that take power away from some people and reorganize in other ways. That's tough in this town. Very hard to change government agencies. But we think it's essential, and we think it's necessary, and we've made an absolute determination to make the tough recommendations if they were right. And the other, the other thing we decided to do, all ten of us together, is our charter expires, and we go out of business as a commission. We do not go out of business as people. And all ten of us have decided to keep in touch, to work, implement these recommendations do everything we can, whether it's testimony or lobbying or speaking or whatever's necessary, to let the American people know about these recommendations, know how important they are, our belief that they can save lives, and continue to work as a group long after our charter goes out of existence. And we agreed to meet in a year to determine our progress. Uh, Tom, may, may I add a word to that? Um... I've uh, certainly served on more commissions than any sane man should. <laughs> In my experience, uh, commissions have clout and impact relating to two factors. One is the quality of work done in the report. Uh, at the end of the day, this town does examine ideas. 
And if the professional work that is done in this report is of the highest quality, as we think it is, that will have an impact on decision makers. The second thing that brings about impact by a commission is the stature of its membership. And I do not think you could exceed the stature of the membership of this commission. We're all, or most of us at least, are former politicians. Some of us, as one of my friends said a moment ago in the Congress, we're washed up politicians. That's an accurate description, I guess. <laughs> but uh, we have a pretty good sense and feel of the politics of this town. If you want to look back on commissions, take a look at the Social Security Commission of a few years back and ask yourself whether or not that commission had impact. Believe you me, it had impact. It restructured the entire Social Security system. And even those commissions that are said to simply file their reports on the wall, we built on the commission reports of a dozen commissions. We stand on their shoulders. We are indebted to them. And I think that uh, we cannot judge, we cannot claim at this time that this commission is going to have a, re uh, a big impact. That remains to be seen. But Tom and I have been enormously pleased by the reception we have had at, in the Republican and Democratic caucuses in the House and in the Senate, by the extraordinary reception we had this morning by the President uh, and the Vice President of the United States. And so we entered the fray here optimistic that we can get some important things done. Uh, if, if I could uh, disagree slightly with that, uh, uh, I would call myself hopeful but not optimistic uh, uh, that these changes will be enacted prior to another terrorist attack on the United States. Regrettable, uh, though that, that may be, uh, these are significant changes we're recommending. Uh, John Diamond asked earlier, said, described it as restructuring. It, it is, this, this is not a private sector company we're talking about restructuring here. This, these are changes in law that we're asking for. Changes in law that will give those who apparently have responsibility the authority necessary to carry out their job. And it will require members of Congress, in some cases, to give up committee assignments that they currently have that they love. It will require in the government people to give up authority that they currently have over hiring, over budgets. The Department of Defense, most notably, will be asked to give up substantial authorities, though they will get substantial new authorities. And in my experience in politics, when somebody is asked to give up something, they will come up with all kinds of reasons other than the most important one, which is they don't want to surrender authority uh, to cite for why they won't want to do it. And I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that the uh, circumstances surrounding this commission will cause Congress to act differently, but I am not optimistic. And I will say, again, say as well that uh, under the leadership of uh, Governor Kane and Congressman Hamilton, this commission did something extraordinary. I want to emphasize that. We were selected by elected politicians in the most partisan city in, in the world, uh, and we reached a unanimous conclusion. And that didn't happen accidentally. This is not the virgin birth you're looking at here. This is uh, 10 people who made a decision that the most important thing for us to do is acquire the unity of purpose that this nation had after we were attacked on the 11th of September. And we need it again before we're attacked again. And I hope, as I said, I'm hopeful that we will acquire it. Uh, but I'm not based upon my experience optimistic that we will. We, uh, we thought about this issue from the very beginning. And we made a couple of decisions which I think are very important. One, we decided to be transparent, which is different from the way prior commissions have operated. And you can see that in our report. One little factoid is that our footnotes, if set in a normal typeface that a normal person could read, would be a 250-page book on their own. Our commission, and I have served on other commissions, most notably the Scowcroft review that dealt with some of these same issues. Most commissions look at policy issues. We started with the facts. And our policy recommendations are tied to those facts and flow ineluctably from them. And so you will find in this report 
the basis for every single recommendation. And as Jim Thompson says, policymakers ignore that at their peril. So we have the facts. We have 9-11 as a tectonic moment in our history. Slay Gordon and I went, visited with an editorial board yesterday, and one of the questions we got was essentially this one. Why will you be any different? A Pew poll has come out that shows that over 60 percent of the American people, even before the rollout of our report, have been following our work and think it's important. We think that this issue has resonance in the country. And the proof will be in whether our leaders come together with the same unity of purpose that we have had to create a unity of effort around the counterterrorism mission. There are bad uh, consequences to being in the middle of a political season, and there are also good ones. Because everyone who is running for office can be asked, do you support these recommendations? Thanks, from Roman. I will be brief, and I just want to say that I believe the recommendations in this particular report will be different, not so much because of the stature of this commission, nor because of uh, the Pew Trust polling data, but because of the perfect storm that is coming together politically. The eyes of history are on our backs, the claws of Al-Qaeda are on our shoulders, and the grief of 9-11 is still in so many Americans' hearts. I think those indicators and reasons are all going to come together and compel members of Congress and others to pass what's in this report and to act on this. We don't have time to waste with another attack coming. We will do a report card in six to 12 months to assess what Congress or the White House has done or not done. We will work with the 9-11 families that have been instrumental in their energy and their commitment to create this commission and keep it going on the right track. And furthermore, with the American people as agents of change, I think they will compel the elected officials and policymakers in this country to make the significant changes, to make this a country that is safer and more secure in a bipartisan manner. We must take those actions today. Uh, Commissioner Fielder. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just to add another thing. You know, often in, in Washington, when a problem occurs and people don't know what to do, or it's a meddlesome problem, they appoint a commission. But what we have here today and the action forcing event of this commission was something quite unprecedented. And, and, we, and we assumed that responsibility and that that was a charter for us to, to think surgically, but think big. And we had a lot of discussions about this. And many people have said since it started to uh, leak out as to what our recommendations were, they've said, you know, why do you make recommendations that are so bold? Why do you make recommendations that are going to be very difficult because somebody has to give up something, somebody has to break a cookie jar? Why do you do that? Why don't you do something that you know has a better percentage chance of passing? And I think after our discussions, the answer that we came to and the reason you see the recommendations we have is the, the question is, if not now, when? So, thank you. All right. I, I, I might say, by the way, that uh, the conversations that Congressman Hamilton and I have had with the leaders in both houses, House and Senate, in both parties, with the President of the United States, with Senator Kerry and Senator Edwards, all those conversations are encouraging. 
and they give us hope that some of these bold recommendations are, in fact, going to be taken very seriously. So that's a question. We'll try to get it, Bobby. Mike Kelly, Bergen Record. Uh, I was struck in the report by the statement about the failure of imagination in our country, and I would just like to know, you've interviewed many government officials throughout your research. Has that, is that failure subsided? Are we beyond that failure of imagination now? And what is the current state of that? Do you want to take that? Mm -hmm. uh, I think the um, failure of imagination we consider to be one of the major failures uh, of the government. The fact of the matter is uh, we just didn't get it in this country. We could not comprehend that um, people wanted to kill us. They wanted to hijack airplanes and flying the, fly them into big buildings and important buildings. Policymakers uh, did not have the imagination to think of that kind of a scenario. There were hints here and there uh, in a variety of places, but as a whole, the government didn't grasp the potential scenario that uh, occurred. We were often advised during the course of the hearings uh, to read very imaginative writers like uh, Tom Clancy and uh, encouraged to um, think outside the box. And I think that's an important part of the counterterrorism uh, effort. Have we gotten beyond the uh, lack of imagination? I'm not sure I can answer that today. But I think all of us are aware of the fact that we have to understand we're contending here against a very entrepreneurial, uh, very innovative uh, enemy who know how to penetrate our open society. They understood that they could get a four-inch knife on board, but maybe not a six-inch knife. And they understood a lot of other weaknesses in the system. So we have to have an imagination strong enough to uh, think about a number of different scenarios. And it is a very key part of a counterterrorism strategy. Let me add to this. Part of the problem here is that it's very difficult to imagine something if the facts are withheld from you. Uh, and, and, and let me let me lead with one and use uh, uh, our, our vice chairman's uh, uh, novelist as the example. In order to have a debate in this country about how much should we spend money, how much should we spend on intelligence, here's how it has to go. According to Tom Clancy, we will spend $40 billion this year on in intelligence. If Mr. Clancy is correct, I believe that's an insufficient amount. Or I will have to say, according to Tom Clancy, we spend $6 billion on the National Reconnaissance Office, and we spend less on the DCI than we do on the Environmental Protection Agency. And if Mr. Clancy is correct, I believe we spend too little. We can't have a public debate because the American people aren't entitled by law to know how much money we're spending on all these agencies. By law. And in the old world, it was because the Soviet Union knew. We didn't want them to know. Well, we tell everybody how big our Navy is. We tell everybody how big our army is. We tell them about everything else having to do with national security. But for some reason, how much we spend on intelligence is withheld. And it creates a tremendous problem. Note, for the record, that 75% of what we knew about, found out about Osama bin Laden after 9-11, we knew in 1996. 90% of the facts that we knew about Osama bin Laden, we knew in 1998. But the full story wasn't delivered until after 9-11. It was held in classified, compartmentalized sections. And it produced a tremendous problem. How in God's name are you supposed to imagine a threat if the facts are being withheld from you? I believe central to the problem that we, that we have dealing with a non-nation state actor is the more information you withhold, the less likely it is that Congress and the American people not only are going to imagine the threat, but provide the political support necessary to deal with that threat. Uh, Tim Berger with Time Magazine. First, a quick housekeeping one and then a deeper one. 
Can you say anything about, um, was any material withheld because of classification disagreements or, we, you know, that you simply were not allowed to release? And uh, more deeply, Mr. Hamilton said earlier that uh, one of the problems before 9-11 is there was no answer to the question of who's in charge. You put forward some recommendations that you hope would fix that, but it could take a while to put them in place. The Homeland Security Department, 15 months later, is still gaining its footing. So it could be a while till there's a statutory answer to that question. In the meantime, is it clear who's in charge now? Is there adequate power and accountability to prevent another terrorist attack? Well, I'll, I'll start with the first question, and Jamie, do you want to take the second, or do you want to take the first? No, second. The, the, uh, this is a report uh, basically without reduction, the redactions. When I told that to the members of the United States Congress, their mouths dropped open. Uh, we were able to work with this government to enable us to reveal a number of things, including things that have already been redacted from other reports. Uh, and um, no, we did not have anything uh, withheld from us. Uh, so this is a uh, complete report. The only redactions, I believe, are some of the sources in the PDBs. Uh, the PDBs themselves, both the Clinton one and the Bush one, are there in full, uh, but some of the sources may be blacked out. But other than that, there are no redactions and nothing withheld, and um, we're very, very grateful for that. The second part of the question, Jim? Yeah, the, just to finish up on that first answer, I mean, the staff worked with the administration where necessary to essentially write around issues, so there's some uh, statements that are perhaps a little less precise than we otherwise would have been, but the no material information has been withheld. On, on your second question, which I think is a very, very uh, important one, the reason that you're hearing such a tone of urgency in our collective voices is because the, the answer to the question uh, that I repeatedly asked and numbers of us asked in our hearings, who is in charge, who is our quarterback, was uh, almost uniformly the President of the United States, which of course he is, but this is not his full-time job. And it is an impossible situation for that to remain the case. We offer what we think is a good and helpful solution to that. As Jim Thompson said, it may not be the only solution, but I think the burden is on others to come up with a better one. Uh, right now, the uh, authorities to act cohesively do not exist. Senator Gordon asked to be excused. He said, uh, there's not any questions you asked. Uh, it is instead the fact that he has an appointment with a number of senators who he's going to talk to about our recommendations. I said that was most important, Senator. Godspeed. <laughs> Chris Mondix of the Philadelphia Inquirer. I'd like to go back to a question that was raised earlier. Uh, Secretary, uh, former Defense Secretary William Cohen testified before your commission that um, to, to the effect that uh, the Clinton administ administration believed that um, Osama bin Laden and um, uh, Iraq collaborated on the uh, construction of a nerve gas factory in, in the Sudan. And it was on that basis that uh, the factory was, was bombed on August 20th, 1998. What I'd like to know is, um, given your finding that there was no collaborative operational relationship, what was it about that testimony and that issue that caused you not to give weight to Secretary Cohen's um, testimony before you? We gave weight to the testimony, and it's the same belief that President Clinton had, the same belief that Sandy Berger has. Uh, but there are a whole bunch of people on the other side who dispute that finding, uh, who say there is no independent collaborative evidence that those chemicals were there. And this is a debate that goes on. We were not able to come to a conclusion in that debate. We could say there is no evidence uh, that we found independent evidence that those chemicals were there. But I can tell you that the belief of people we all respect uh, from the President of the United States, President Clinton, down through Sandy Berger and down through uh, Cohen, uh, believe very, very strongly uh, that they were right to target that factory, and in fact it was what they thought it was. But the evidence is so is not there, and the, uh, and the facts are being argued against, and we could not come to a fact-based conclusion on that one.
Doug Pasternak at NBC News. Um, you've stayed away from placing blame on both the Clinton and Bush administrations, but could you tell us where you think they could have done a better job, uh, especially in the area of domestic surveillance and collection of intelligence? Look, we have some of the same comments to make, frankly, about both presidents. We believe they understood thoroughly the threat from Osama bin Laden. We believe they both took actions uh, that they thought were necessary uh, to meet that threat. Uh, they met, they talked about it, they talked to their advisors about it. We also believe uh, that they did not take it uh, as seriously as it should be taken. It was not that top priority. It was not a top of the priority list. Uh, and that reflected, by the way, the American people. It reflected the um, presidential campaign. I mean, we had an entire presidential campaign in 2000, right? Thousands and thousands of words spoken, as are all, uh, always spoken in presidential campaigns. We can find only one reference to terrorism in the entire campaign. That means the reporters weren't asking questions, the American people weren't asking questions, the Congress wasn't stimulating discussion, and it wasn't there. So, yeah, uh, we do believe both presidents uh, could have done more in this area. Uh, but we also believe that, like the rest of us, they did not envision this as the kind of problem it obviously already was. And by the way, they were not served, in my opinion, they were not served properly by the intelligence agencies of this country. Uh, having read every single presidential daily briefing having anything to do with this subject, under two administrations, I can tell you that the two presidents of the United States were not well served by they, those agencies, and they did not, in my opinion, have the information they needed to make the decisions they had to make. Tom, if, if I may just add, I, I think that uh, um, both Presidents Clinton and Bush understood that al-Qaeda was a dangerous threat to the country. I think in both cases they took a number of steps, uh, military, covert actions, diplomatic steps, uh, to deal with the threat. Now, obviously it turned out that, that those steps were not sufficient. Uh, what I believe and I think we say in our report is that they, like the rest of us, uh, did not understand the gravity of the threat. Or to put it another way, they did not understand that 3,000 people could be killed in an hour's time. If you look back, all of us had signals we recite those signals at great length in the report, and we simply did not put them together to understand that terrorism was the predominant national security threat to the United States. You didn't have to have access to PDBs or secret information to figure that out. Uh, there's a long list of attacks by terrorists against the United States. But we simply did not understand how serious and how grave the threat well, was. So my view is that the presidents um, acted, understood that a threat exists, but like most of us, uh, did not understand the gravity of it. If, uh, I, Bob, could, if, well, uh, if I could add to it, too, I think one, one of the things that we say in the report is that and it's, it's, it's difficult as powerful a motivator as attacks that are here. When, when uh, Yusuf uh, 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 and, and, and uh, Mir Amal Khanzi uh, killed Americans on uh, U.S. soil in 1993, in January and February of 1993, Yusuf blowing up the World Trade Center, Khanzi killing two CIA employees uh, in Langley, uh, we didn't have to demonstrate that they were, they were the overriding threat to the United States of America to deploy all our resources to hunt them down until we were able to render them back to the United States and then try them and convict them, which is what we did. 
both of those men were brought to justice in the, in the United States of America. Uh, and we didn't find ourselves troubled by all kinds of diplomatic nicety requirements, et cetera, or that we had to prove uh, that there was a great national security threat here. I, I say again, one of the problems with, with, with uh, Osama bin Laden is that I'm uncomfortable actually having to say to the American people, I'm not sure that either President Clinton or President Bush had the full narrative of who he was until after 9-11 that he was involved with a series of attacks against U.S. military and civilian personnel for nine years prior to 9-11. I'm not 100 percent certain that all of those things were known by either President Clinton or by President Bush prior to 9-11. And one of the reasons for this failure of imagination really gets right to the heart of our organizational recommendations because it was an institutionalized failure of imagination. We went into the 21st century in an era of transnational terror with a government apparatus that was designed following World War II to uh, fight the Cold War. It's a 50-year-old apparatus uh, dating from the 1947 uh, uh, National Security Act, and it is one that is that totally separates foreign intelligence and foreign threats from domestic. And our domestic security uh, was uh, simply utterly incapable of imagining the threat and dealing with it that was internal to the United States. So that is why we are not just recommending moving around the deck chairs and boxes on organization charts. There is a deep fundamental dysfunction in the way we go about our intelligence gathering and analysis and providing the data to the, the decision makers. Victoria Jones, Talk Radio News Service. You talk in the report about assistance from Hezbollah and Iran to Al-Qaeda. We've heard recently about the hijackers who passed through Iran. But you also say that any relationship currently between Iran and Hezbollah uh, seems to have been concealed. Is it your view that there is a current relationship, a collaborative relationship between Iran and Al-Qaeda? We don't know of any current relationship, I, I don't think, I've seen in our research. We do know there were relationships in the past. Um, we, knew that, we, we do know that these relationships were serious and over a period of time. We do know that when people wanted to get through Iran uh, to Afghanistan to meet with Osama bin Laden, including a number of the hijackers, they were able to do so. Uh, without marks in their passports that would indicate they had been through Iran. We know that kind of collaboration. Uh, but there is no evidence whatsoever, for instance, that Iran knew anything about the attack on 9-11, or certainly assisted it in any way whatsoever. Uh, so we, um, we know of a relationship, uh, how deep that relationship is, and uh, we don't know if it exists to this day. Um, that's going to require more research. I think, uh, I, I think this is an area that really does need more investigation. Uh, what we find at this point is, number one, Iran and Hezbollah did provide assistance to uh, various types to al-Qaeda uh, in the years before 9-11. And secondly, as the chairman has said, we have not seen evidence that would suggest that uh, Iran uh, or Hezbollah had any pre-knowledge of 9-11, and it is our view that al-Qaeda planned this operation uh, and carried it out uh, by themselves. Okay. Thank you all. We do believe that in this volume, our recommendations that will make the American people safer. Thank you all very much.